Great. Share. Well, does everyone see that? Am I muted? Okay, great. So yeah, welcome everybody. Um, so we will go ahead and start the presentation today. Um, but for today's agenda, it's a similar format to kind of all our other meetings the past few months. Um, we'll just do a quick introduction um, to kind of the focus topic overview and I'll breeze over that since many of you have seen it. And But for the new steers, steering committee members, I'll try to kind of explain it a little bit more. Um, so the background's provided there. Uh, but really, uh, we're going to spend 15 minutes, again, just talking about some of the background information as it relates to um, complete and green streets. And we'll kind of talk about what that really means, um, identify you know what we've heard, I, uh, talk about the key issues and opportunities associated with these topics, and then really, um, again, go into breakout groups where we'll talk for about 45 minutes um, uh, uh, just to be able to bounce off ideas with each other and then come back um, after uh, a quick break for five minutes um, to do a report out. Um, and then we'll talk about next steps at the end of the presentation. So again, uh, some of the Zoom rules that you know, you've all been following along here, um, just you know, to be able to turn on your video when possible, uh, to make sure that you know um, you're we're being respectful with one another, and also um, for key members of the uh, for members of the public, if you are here with us, um, send us a chat um, um, so we can answer it at the end, uh, or send us your questions via chat so we can answer it at the end. Um, and just a reminder that meeting is recorded uh, is being recorded right now and will be posted on the website. Uh, so key ground rules, um, I think, you know, these are the same rules that we've been following for, for a while now, but just as a reminder, first before seconds, um, so allowing really the space for uh, you and then others to talk, um, when agreeing, avoid repeating what others have said, um, when disagreeing, be respectful and focus on the idea, uh, not the person, and, and really use that raise hand function or chat um, if you want to grab someone's attention or want to speak uh, while someone's talking and want to be up next. So just another reminder of where we are at, um, we're still in phase two of really talking about these issues in greater detail. Um, and that will lead us into developing initial recommendations that will ultimately be rolled into a, a draft plan. Um, so right now it's still early um, and we still have plenty of time to kind of work with the community, work with the steering committee members to um, go back and forth on, you know, what are the issues and how are we gonna address some of them um, and so that we can have this iterative process uh, where we're able to have, um, you know, strong recommendations that come out of this phase. Um, and then ultimately will come again in a form of a draft plan um, next year. And we're anticipating adoption to be happening uh, by spring or summer of 2023. So again, just a reminder on the focus topics. Um, so these focus topics that we're discussing here today um, is number two, complete and green streets. So these focus topics really extend across multiple topics of what uh, the neighborhood plans address. Um, so for complete and green streets, that means it has an overlap between mobility and quality of life. So those two topics are what we're gonna uh, focus most on today. Um, so I'll turn it over to our consultants, let them introduce themselves and they'll go over the kind of the main substance of the presentation. Is um sorry. Is Eileen or Jennifer? Oh, yep. Nope. Sorry. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I am so sorry about that, everyone. Um, Jennifer Bartlett with Alta Planning and Design, and I'm really happy to be here tonight to talk with you guys about complete and green streets. Um, so we'll do this in a couple of steps. We'll talk about major transit streets first. We'll have some polling questions and talking about um you know, what's important on those streets and then why that's important to you. And then we'll dive a little bit deeper and talk about neighborhood streets and cover a couple of questions. Um, you know, two streets that you prioritize, what would you like to see for green infrastructure? What are barriers and opportunities in your neighborhood? Next slide. 
So a little bit of kind of what we heard to this point. Um, so there's a lot of really good stuff. There's some ideas and there's some dislikes. So likes, um, it's walkable, it's bikeable. You've got great access to downtown, access to light rail and highways. Um, dislikes, like a lot of areas around town, there's some dangerous intersections, car speed, um, sidewalks are narrow or non-existent. Um, increasing traffic is a problem. There are some major barriers and some public transit difficulties. And then um, plenty of good ideas have come out of this process so far. We'll share a few, and then maybe we can get into some of these in our small groups. Ideas for traffic calming. You know, how can we slow traffic down? Um, wider sidewalks are a request around the whole study area. Safer and more crossings, particularly on the major streets, that's Federal, Spear, and 38th, but there are others. Um, obviously, safer crossings near schools and parks has been something that's come up. Um, the interest in more protected bike lanes and bike facilities. And then, generally speaking, better connections across interstates and railroads, just to name a few. Next slide. Okay. I think we know why we're here. So I'll turn it over to Krista. We'll walk you through some of those key issues. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Krista. I'm also with Alta. Just getting some screens arranged. All right. So our first key issue um, for mobility in the near Northwest lies in the fact that many roadways are not meeting the community's needs for modes of travel other than vehicles. Um, during the previous engagement efforts, people expressed that existing neighborhood transportation network doesn't provide enough space or comfort for pedestrians and cyclists. As well, multiple streets in the area are designated as future high capacity transit streets, but currently don't have the infrastructure to meet that need. In order to accommodate these additional transportation modes, complete streets are needed. Um, complete streets ensure that multiple transportation modes are provided space and infrastructure. On certain streets, some modes are given more or less priority. However, complete streets ensure that the neighborhood and city overall each mode has a complete network to safely travel around on. Um, the map at right shows complete street opportunity locations using the black dashed line style. All right, next slide. All right, um, so the next key issue. Ooh. All right, thanks. <laughs> um, the next key issue is that intersections um, aren't really completely safe in the neighborhood. Um, and we have high injury networks running through the neighborhood, uh, sorry, through the study area. Um, three streets in the near Northwest have been identified as part of this high injury network. Um, you can see that in yellow in the slide. The high injury network is the collection of streets where the majority of crashes happen citywide. These three streets are Federal, Spear, and 38th Avenue. These are the same streets where the city plans for high capacity transit in the future. In addition, the grid switch between low high and the rest of the near Northwest and the diagonal nature of Spear lead to the creation of five-way intersections and intersections with extremely sharp or wide turns. Um, the intersection shown above requires an almost 180 degree turn from Spear onto 29th. Um, and these intersections create long crossing distance for distances for pedestrians, confusion for drivers, difficulties for bicyclists, and allow for too much vehicle speed through turns. Um, the intersection with the most bicycle and pedestrian involved crashes in the New West is at the intersection of 20th, Central, and 32nd. Um, that's the exit of ID25 um, heading south uh, onto 20th. All right, next slide. All right, our next mobility issue is that there are multiple gaps and deficiencies in the current bike network. Gaps are areas where people want and need to bike to get from point A to point B, but the lack of infrastructure deters people. Um, as an example of gap, a gap, the photo above shows a biker walking on the sidewalk to cross to Chaffee Park from Sunnyside due to the uncomfortable nature of biking and heavy traffic on Federal. Um, this is a necessary point in order to cross I-70. Deficiencies are areas where there might technically be a bike facility, but it is very uncomfortable to use. The dashed lines in the slide highlight in yellow are bike facility improvements that will be built in the next two years. These investments will help significantly, but there will still be gaps to address. The gaps that will remain can be seen on the map in the white areas with blue dashed lines. All right, next slide. Our last mobility issue is that of inadequate sidewalks. The map on the right shows in orange where sidewalks are less than four feet wide. This is mainly an issue in Chaffee Park and the north side of uh, north areas of Sunnyside that have narrow sidewalks attached to the curb. These can be uncomfortable or uh, to walk along because of proximity to traffic and the narrow width makes them difficult to walk uh, side by side, travel in a wheelchair or push a stroller. 
Some areas in red lack sidewalks altogether. Finally, major transit corridors like Federal Sphere and 38 have sidewalks that are quite narrow and uneven. This can make take, taking transit less appealing because the walk to get there is unpleasant, unpleasant and dangerous. Um, especially where these sidewalks are attached, is that it is uncomfortable to walk near high volume, high speed and loud vehicle travel lanes. For reference, the Denver street design guidelines recommend a minimum of six foot sidewalk on low volume local streets. And per city standard, sidewalks on arterial streets should be eight foot wide and separated from the road by a 12 foot tree lawn. As you can see from the photo above, um, that is not always the case. That photo is on Sphere. All right, thanks. Hi, I'm Eileen Flax with Studio CPG. I'm a landscape architect and um, we've been looking at the area um, in terms of stormwater and green infrastructure. So in the diagram on the left, you see impervious surfaces. Those are um, roads and buildings shown in black. And um, there's a lot of impervious surface in this area that has a negative impact on the water quality coming out of this area because when it rains, water quickly flows over the pavement, picks up sediment and pollutants, and then quickly carries it straight down to the South Platte, negatively impacting that basin. Um, it also means that the water doesn't stay in the area supporting trees. So you see on the right, um, we have elevated surface temperatures related to heat islands. Next slide, please. So this loss of permeable ground has happened incrementally. And this is a pattern we've seen throughout the city. So in the diagram on the left, we see impervious surfaces in blue and gray and orange. Um, and that green area, the pervious area where water can infiltrate in green. And over time, incrementally, lot by lot, we've increased the amount of impermeable or impervious surfaces in the basin. And as I said, this is something that's happening throughout the city. Um, in most other areas, that leads to flooding. And we're fortunate to not have any significant large scale um, flooding here, but it also means that we, all, we won't be having any large scale projects that address flooding and also address water quality at the same time. We're gonna be looking for opportunities to increase permeable ground incrementally in the same way that it's been removed to incrementally add it. So next slide, please. So we're looking for opportunities uh, related to green infrastructure um, like stormwater planters. These are areas adjacent to roads where water can be slowed and stilled and infiltrate so that it's not rushing straight out of the basin. And we're, we're improving water quality and hopefully supporting vegetation and, um, and habitat as well in connection to that. Next slide, please. Another um, green infrastructure opportunity is permeable pavement. So there are areas um, in parking lanes where we have included permeable pavements. We can also look at entire street sections where again, the water can be slowed and stilled and stay in the basin a little longer supporting vegetation. Next slide. Um, another opportunity we're looking at are historic parkways. Um, Spear Boulevard and Federal Boulevard are both historic parkways that run through the neighborhood. Um, and so they're fairly constrained roadways, but we're looking for opportunities in adjacent areas like Viking Park along Spear Boulevard. Um, there are a ton of projects going on along Federal Boulevard to kind of improve that, that historic parkway and reinforce that character. And then also um, something like 46th Avenue, which isn't a parkway through this neighborhood, but is to the west. And that can really serve to provide an integrated network to our parks connections to our parks as part of the parkway system. Thank you. Okay, one last opportunity to chat about before we go into some of our polling questions will be open streets or otherwise known as Sunday streets. They've been really popular around the world um, and began to show up in Denver during COVID. So really it's an opportunity to reuse the street, close it to traffic, open it up to pedestrians. You see some examples here, Arvada has got um, one, I'm not sure if it's still up and then Denver has had a few. So something to think about as we consider um, ways to use our streets. Next slide. 
And then this map here um, really starts to get at what have been identified as potential opportunities going forward. Um, what this map is, is kind of an overlay of data. So green infrastructure opportunities, bike routes, um, and then, um, yeah, I think we'll just keep it simple. So it's really those opportunities overlaid. And so what we begin to see are places where we may be able to accomplish more than one goal at a time. So east-west, our streets end up being 50th, 46th, 38th, 35th, and Spear. And then um, north-south would be Zunai, Tejon, Navajo, and Lipan. And you'll see a lot of discussion coming up um, about those streets. But like I said, this map is show, sort of beginning to show where we can achieve multiple goals at once um, on streets and roads in the study area. Next slide. Okay. Um, we'll move into some of those polling questions we promised. And um, so the first opportunity is looking at some of these transit streets. And with 38, some things to consider um, current existing conditions. Um, it all, and just so you know, it's identified as a medium capacity street. It's about 75 to 80 feet wide right of way. It's got narrow sidewalks. It's a fairly high volume traffic and tough to cross. So the question, which will apply to all three of these is what components do you value most for 38th Avenue as you envision it in the future? Greater transit, slower speeds, wider sidewalks, newer, better bike facilities, car parking, more street trees or landscaping or green infrastructure elements, um, street furniture, better lighting, or if there's something else, you can put it in the other category. Can everyone see the polling? Yeah, I think so. I'm, I'm getting results right now. Okay, great. Sorry, I couldn't find my mute button. I can't see folks responding. Can you see how folks oh, are doing? It's slowing down. I'll close it in about 10 seconds. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So let me see. So an interest in wider sidewalks, um, tied for slower speeds and reliable transit, um, more tree trees and landscaping, and then not terribly far behind bike facilities, right, and street furniture. Car parking, last but not least, and what do we have? Better lighting, and then other. Okay. Sorry, I'm just taking a picture of it real quick. <laughs> yeah, okay. we will revisit this information in our breakout groups, just so you know. Okay, so another, the next poll question would be um, similar to the last one, is what do you value for SPEAR? And just so you um, are sort of aware of where we are with that, high traffic volume, um, narrow, dangerous sidewalks, not surprising. And that section changes. So we go uh, four travel lanes and a turn lane. Sometimes it varies. It is also a start park lane. So same as before, um, what components do you most value for Spear Boulevard?
I'll give it 10 more seconds. Okay, so for spear, um, what is it looking like? Street trees and landscaping, followed by reliable transit, um, slower speeds, wider sidewalks, street furniture. So a lot of interest, um, a lot of ties really, better lighting. So our third poll question deals with federal, um, but before we jump into the poll, let's talk a little bit about what's going on out there right now as far as studies go, a lot. There's a lot, so it's not quite the focus um, of this effort given how much planning and design work is going on. Um, so way more than I'll cover here, I think it's safe to say that um, from design to construction, there's a lot of interest and attention being paid to federal right now. Next slide, I think there's a website listed on the next slide too, if you wanna dive into the projects, yeah. Okay, so um, there's a federal Boulevard Improvement program project going on. And um, I think the survey is open, it was before. Federalpetimprovements.com is the um, website for the survey, but so those improvements include curb ramps, cross signals, um, sidewalk expansion, green space, gathering areas and other safety enhancements. So all that to say, uh, well, it, the next question is about federal. There's a lot of work going on there already. So next slide would be the poll. Um, let's see, just some details on that. It's 90 feet wide, give or take, um, curb to curb, some 60 to 90. You've got light poles in the sidewalk, um, sometimes as little as four and a half feet wide, they're sometimes attached, sometimes detached, so it varies accordingly. And then at key intersections, you've got transit stops, um, commercial businesses with rollover curbs, um, large parking lanes between, and so you've got vehicles pulling out and um, impeding traffic flow. So certainly last but not least, what would you value? What do you value for federal? What would you like to see on federal rules? I'll give it 10 more seconds again. Let's see what we showed. So reliable transit along federal is of interest, street furniture. Let's see, there's the top two. I believe so, wider sidewalks, um, better lighting, and then also slower vehicle speeds. Um, oh, very highly rated would be the street trees and landscaping. And then other, um, at least one other, so cool. Like facilities don't rank. Um, and that's feedback we'd seen, the difficult street to ride on, so not a priority. Sorry, all, all vans. I'm just trying to oh, yeah. save these. No problem. No, that's okay. That's the last polling question. Um, and I guess we can also then, um, yeah, I guess just go into breakout groups. Great. Um, I will break out the rooms right now. Um, it looks like it's 6.32. Um, so around um, 7.15, 7, a little couple minutes past 7.15, I'll regroup the group um, and then we can do uh, report outs. So thanks everybody. And I will break everyone out right now. Mm. <laughs> Too many screens, okay. Do you have any stragglers? Nope, all right.
All right. Getting everyone back. Hope everyone had a good discussion. Great, I think everyone is back now. Um, we will take about five minutes. And so that's kind of perfect. We'll resume back at 7.20. So giving everyone about five, six minutes for a break. So we'll do that and then we'll come back and we'll do a little discussion and, and close this out. Thanks everybody. You're a lifesaver, thanks so much. <laughs> so yeah, we're gonna do kind of like we have in the other previous meetings. We wanna hear kind of like what the other groups have talked about, kind of hear, um, you know, any unique ideas and like where there was seemed to be some consensus. So hopefully there was a volunteer from each of your group and the goal is to be concise. We wanna probably keep it to around five minutes each and just touch on kind of the main, the main points. So, um, we don't want you to kind of read through all of the notes, um, just kind of touch on the main points. Um, and so our first person, we want to kind of be our role model <laughs> for, for keeping it concise. Um, and um, I'm going to call out Ashton from our group who was gracious enough to volunteer yet again <laughs> to, to, to provide a summary of what we spoke about. Thank you, Ashton. Okay. Grace, are you going to put the notes up to, or am I doing that? Do you, need the, do you need the notes up? Um, would it be possible? Yeah, to share. That them. could be helpful. Awesome, thank you. <laughs> okay. At least remind me of the questions. Yeah. Um, <laughs> all right. All right, so uh, of course we had a very, very spirited uh, conversation per usual in our breakout session. And uh, what we all agreed on is there just wasn't enough time. There's never enough time. Uh, so generally, uh, most of us agreed with those poll questions. That was the first thing we talked about. Most of us generally agreed with the poll results. I will do a shout out real quick to uh, the newbie, Bill Hare, who stuck his uh, neck out and mentioned that he did not uh, think that we should be uh, talking about additional uh, slowing of traffic on our roads, our primary roads like 38th or Federal or Spear, because those are uh, important roadways to keep the traffic moving at a functional speed, slow enough for safety, but still keeping those roads uh, functional and moving traffic along. Uh, and so we had a very good conversation about that. Uh, we talked about prioritizing which north south streets, of course, um, should be prioritized for non car modes in our neighborhoods. Uh, we talked about Zunai, uh, particularly in Highland. Uh, we talked about um, some of the roads here in, in my neighborhood, Jefferson Park, uh, that have already become bike lanes. And if you narrow those streets even more, uh, it's really going to slow down the traffic, perhaps on some roads that we want to keep that traffic flowing. Um, a little bit farther north, uh, identifying 44th as a road going east-west. Uh, and, and several others, as the notes kind of jump around here, 50th uh, up north, uh, and, and just trying to find that balance. So I think it's great if you're moving this along, if you want to just slide that down oh, I so I can remember yeah. everything. Krista, are you All moving? Right, thank you so much. Right. <laughs> I'm not sure who's moving it. I know I'm not. Uh, so barriers, right? Uh, I'm sure most of the breakout committees uh, had sent similar ideas on this. Um, in the, in the Highland area, connecting the Central Promenade along 25 uh, and, and getting the connection uh, to the other side. Uh, we talked about some of the issues a little bit farther south, like on the uh, 23rd Avenue bridge crossing 25, how it's gotten much better for bike transportation, but not pedestrian. You cross um, as a pedestrian and you find yourself in dirt and weeds on the other side. Um, and there was a lot of discussion specifically about the intersection, if we want to call it that, at Spear and 29th, which is a complete mess for all modes of transportation, whether vehicular, pedestrian, or on a bike. Uh, that is just such a mess. And so we did spend probably more time than we should have uh, discussing that one particular intersection that everyone agreed must, must get some improvement. 
Uh, if you want to scroll down to the next section, all right, there we go. Um, so in terms of barriers, again, uh, talking, I mean, it, it's, I think, again, all, I think all the breakout sessions are probably going to have a similar answer here. You know, the barriers being federal, uh, being I-25, um, and all of the, the various issues that we have um, getting across those major thoroughfares at this point. Um, we talked about better pedestrian access, specifically from the Diamond Hill area, going across and sort of where there's some of those bigger, wider, longer gaps for access crossing 25 uh, from our four neighborhoods. And I think that was most of what we discussed. Oh, yes. Perfect. Uh, the infrastructure. Thank you. Um, so we, we kind of took an interesting uh, spin on this, um, you know, whether we would prioritize stormwater planters um, versus permeable pavements. And uh, we kind of got into a discussion about how, um, you know, we live in a desert. We get 15 inches of water every year. This is going to be the driest April we've ever had. Um, and if we start promoting stormwater planters, the concern is that they may look great for a portion of the year, but most of the year they're not going to look great. And in times of drought and less water, uh, it's probably gonna look pretty bad and we can't expect the city uh, to maintain those. So as a group, I think we agreed uh, that permeable pavers would be the better way to go. Thank you so much, Ashton. That. Yeah, thank you. So can I, so I believe we had, is it two, two other groups? Can I get a, one of the volunteers from the other group to share kind yeah. of their report out? I'm, I'm uh, this, I believe the second group. Um, I'm just trying to make sure I get organized where we are. Okay, yeah. Is that correct? You're with Eileen? Yeah. And, okay. mm -hmm. So I guess just keeping it moving. I mean, we basically agreed with a lot of the same things that were um, brought up in the um, poll. And then I'd say, you know, we also kind of second group one in that really kind of focusing on um, any adjustments we can make to the uh, less primary streets, like the secondary streets, like Zunai, Tejon, Pecos, uh, La Pan, and less about like the bigger streets, like 38th and Federal and Spear. I mean, I think obviously those could use some help um, in a lot of crossing areas, but as far as like bikes and all that, we all kind of agreed that that was less of a priority because um, not all, many of us wouldn't use that. So um, I think that that was that section. Um, you know, I'd say from a, from a, like a, a intersection standpoint, which I might, I might be jumping ahead, but I know we really talked about crossing um, at 23rd and Federal because um, unfortunately one of our uh, steering members was um, actually hit there as a pedestrian. So um, I, it sounds like, you know, I'm not right by there, but that sounds like a really major one that's come up multiple times and that came up multiple times in our conversation and in the focus group. So um, I would say that. And then, you know, we talked about um, potentially, um, you know, again, using the um, secondary streets to, um, to prioritize um, traffic where people would go slower on those anyway, um, drivers, I mean. Um, and then... Um, yeah, I think, let's see. Oh, some of the um, other things we talked about. Yeah, like crossing 38th in general um, seems to be a big one um, to get north south. And then um, one thing that I actually brought up, which I noticed that they do downtown um, in some areas is kind of the where they pause the um, both sides of traffic from going and then you're allowed to like all pedestrians can go. So it's not, you know, because I think it's tough when even the, it's a, a walk is allowing you to go, but then people are trying to turn right or left from the other you know, side of the street. So I think it's helpful to have maybe a pause at some of these bigger intersections to potentially you know, give everybody 30 seconds to cross um, in all the ways where traffic is not moving. Um, that was one idea. Um, and then the, yeah, we, we were talking again, federal, uh, federal 23rd came up and then it, also the I-70 crossings um at federal and lowell was also a big one um it, you know it we kind of all talked about that one a lot and that there's no light there so we've seen quite a bit of um accidents um where you know you're trying to turn left off of i-70 onto lowell or it just seems like that's a really tough one um from everybody trying to move around with no light um because even there is a light at zunai and, and i-70 and that 
that seems like a really great intersection that works out really well for pedestrians um, and cars. And then this one we kind of talked about a little bit. Um, we didn't have as much to say about this, but we did have somebody from Dottie on our group. And um, he actually mentioned that um, even though it seems like maybe the permeable pavers would be a better potential option that they are, you know, it sounds like pretty expensive and not the priority for Dottie. It would be more, um, more for the um, stormwater planters in that direction, but um, we didn't spend too much time on this question. Thanks so much, Lexi, that was great. Grace, you're on mute. Grace, you're on mute. Sorry, my mouse disappeared. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you so much, Lexi. Okay, so now we wanna to move to the our last group. Um, where's, is this the beginning of, of the things for us here? Or? It is. Okay. Um, it's major transit street polling uh, reactions. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think something that surprised us a bit was how much safety was a, uh, priority in our group. And it was safety on crossing the fast wide streets, but it was also finding ways of calming uh, around schools and parks and those kind of things. Because um, you think about there's North High close to federal, there's uh, several elementary schools just down from 38. There's uh, elementary schools up in, uh, up in the North part. And, you know, one of the things that we talked about was maybe having some raised at, at the pedestrian crossings, having a raised thing that slows people by because it's a bump. A speed bump, um, which would also handle some ADA issues we might have there. Um, car parking was not a big thing for us, uh, especially on the main streets. Um, parking is not always the best use for the transit focused streets, um, bigger deal in residential areas. Um, you need to think about the streets. Uh, especially the big transit streets as uh, part of a broader set of systems, not just as physical driving and crossing spaces. Um, so let's, let's see what else up. Let's go up a little. Okay, uh, which north south streets in the area are key? Um, what we talked about was the fact that we kind of all know the north-south streets. You know, we've got Tejon, we talked about quite a bit. We have uh, uh, Zuni, Federal, of course. Um, but in other areas like Chaffee Park, uh, the, the streets that need more attention may be east-west streets. And Amanda pointed out to us that the city thinks in terms of northwest streets in a lot of cases. But... Uh, that's not always what we should be doing. We talk quite a bit about safe zones, about how we, we either blocked off streets during, during COVID, uh, usually around restaurant areas to give people more, more room to have people eat safely outside. But were there places we still needed to consider that in terms of, uh, in terms of transit? And especially thinking about going back to what we were talking about last time, with mixed use and making pedestrian friendly friendly spaces. And part of that is in fact, them being able to get to those, get past the, the busy streets. Um, we brought up the intersection of Tejon and 16th by Little Man, which is uh, a heavy pedestrian area, heavy biking area, but it curves, the hills are different directions. People are driving faster, they're limited line of sight. And if we have more than just that one, which I suspect we do, how do we deal with those as a specific special kind of process or special kind of problem? Um, let's see. Um, how do we safely get to our transit areas? Much more difficult in Jefferson Park, for instance, than it is 
in some of the other areas. And and so, for instance, trying to get to uh, downtown, down to, uh, you know, across the interstate for some, for Jefferson Park. Maybe we need a pedestrian bridge like we have coming out of out of Lower Highland, for instance. Okay, barriers. Uh, La Pan getting the Inca Street connection. Um, okay, barriers connectivity. Um, Ludi is a north-south through street that becomes an east-west when you get on to 26. Um, let's run us down into three a little bit here. Major barriers. Um, so, um, nope, nope. Okay. Uh, uh, no, down, down, down. No. I lost it. I'm. I'm so we didn't get as really far as the green infrastructure. We did talk about something that group two talked about of uh, the underpass on 38 becoming a lake periodically. And are there better and safer ways of getting pedestrians and bicycles past that? Are there putting in permeable walls and, and uh, streets, not just in that, um, not just in the underpass, but approaching it. So the water drains before it gets to the overpass. Um, scoring okay i'm not anything? seeing any more um I don't see no. notes. is there anything i forgot team that was on team three um we did talk a little bit about um the upstream need, not downstreaming the need for permeable solutions that it should be a network that starts further up than the street um, right. Yeah. That, that's the one which, thing. Which, that, greens, which greenscaping really helps with. Thanks, mm -hmm. Renee. That that was a good one not to have forgotten. You know, yeah, and maybe has, not just depending on paving. I'm sorry, Rebecca. Property, yes. Go yeah, ahead. We also, we also asked whether what CPD's requirements are right now for permeable infrastructure because, you know, we've incrementally been losing green space through development, but how mm -hmm. are we gonna incrementally gain it back? That's just not yeah. likely to happen. So why aren't we, you know, uh, doing more permeable, uh, you know, um, solutions right now? And no one had an answer on what the current requirement is, if there is one. Yeah. Okay, anyone else from our group real quick? Anything you forgot? Thanks, Rebecca. Yes, we're done. Oh, thanks, Rebecca, and thanks for other folks from Group Three for chiming in as well. Um, yeah, no, and thank you guys for having such a thoughtful discussion about this topic. So I think just have a kind of a few more next steps to discuss before we let you go this evening. I'm gonna wait. I think I need the PowerPoint maybe pulled back up. Yeah. Yeah, sure. thanks. <laughs> you know right now. Great. So, um, so you can see we have a calendar here with a lot of kind of upcoming events. Um, our events for Chafee Park have already been completed. So the 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 roundtable and the workshop, but our events for Sunnyside Highland in Jefferson Park are kind of going to be happening over the next couple of weeks. And of course, the online survey is still open. Um, but before we close out, we really wanted to have a conversation with you guys about how the steering committee can really help promote participation in these meetings and um, promoting participation in the in the online survey because, you know, this project isn't going to be a success if it doesn't really reflect the needs and aspirations of the community and without great participation we're really not gonna, we're not gonna have that and so far the participation in the meetings have been pretty light. Um, and so we really are looking to you as steering committees, when you, steering committee members, one of the important role that you guys have is to be kind of champions for this cause and really help us get that participation. Um, and so we kind of wanted to talk about it as a group. So I guess what I wanted to sort of just 
open up with saying is like, what what have folks tried so far to kind of get people to participate, whether that's in a in the survey, a workshop, or an in-person, an in-person workshop or with one of the online roundtables. Um, if any of the if any members want to share something that they've done to kind of try to try to raise awareness or raise per participation, try to get someone there. Well, we're using our neighborhood association as much as possible to get the word out. Same with uh, Sunnyside. Same for Chafee Park too. Uh, for Saturday's event, they posted while it was happening and talked about like the tamales and the churros that they had and tried to encourage and entice people that way. Important point, there's in the in-person workshops, there will be tamales and churros. Yeah. For through their neighborhood committees, have, have you guys felt that was successful? Did you get folks to, to show up? Do you feel like folks, do you know of any folks who were showed up? I think we heard, I know I, I was at the, the virtual and I think most, a lot of people had heard from the signs, I think um, maybe was how a lot of people had heard about the event. Um, and so, so it, or maybe kind of broaden the question. So in your neighborhood, when you think of like outreach and what that has been successful to get folks out and maybe particularly on these like community issues, right? Not just kind of fun neighborhood things. So have you guys, could you could have any thoughts or examples of how, how outreach has been done well to promote participation or what have you seen kind of from your experience in the community? Hi, my name's Diane Durand and I uh, actually joined you guys late. I'm sorry, I'm not sure how to turn on my camera. I'm a student at Regis University. That's where I originally joined, but I grew up on 41st and Clay and in the third grade, we moved to 42nd and Federal, and I finished grade school at St. Catharines, went to Holy Family, the old Holy Family. When I lived in Arvada, I rode my bike to downtown Denver to work like three days a week. Obviously, the whole traffic flow has changed since then. Um, but one of the questions, I just want to let you know, I have a little bit of background in that area, even though I no longer live there. Uh, my brother still lives there in my parents' home, um, and he does a lot of walking. But um, my question is, what about like email notifications? Like, are people able to register for email? And then is can a reminder go out to say, hey, this is the night of the meeting? Um, I just, I wasn't sure. I, this is my first night. And one of the things as I was going through meetings for my class, this just sparked my interest because uh, that's just where I grew up and my brother still lives there. Um, he had a brain injury when he was a kid and my other brother and I helped care for him, although he's very independent. Um, so I just, I was just interested in this topic because of that. But one thing I know is that I get text reminders and email reminders about a lot of stuff. Is there, has, have you tried signing people up? I mean, I don't know. I don't know if that's been successful or unsuccessful. Yeah, we, we do have an email list um, that um, a lot of people do sign up for and, and, and put out reminders um, enough so people are reminded of what's happening next. Um, we definitely don't want to email people every other day or otherwise they'll just kind of block us or put us into spam. But yeah, we do have a, a email okay. and a newsletter and, and we frequently, um, yeah, get the word out that way. Right. And and just so you know, you know, we've, we lived in that neighborhood for a really long time. I mean, when we moved, when my family moved to 41st and Clay, there were still vacant lots. <laughs> That's where I grew up. <laughs> so I'm very familiar with how things have transitioned. <laughs> So it's wonderful to hear you all talk about increasing pedestrian and bicycle safety and all that. It's wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank, no, and thank you. We also do yard yeah, signs and flyers. Okay. Yard signs and flyers. Yeah. Uh, so Grace, to your other question, I think what you guys are, you know, the same challenges you have, we have the same challenges without the budget that you guys have. So, you know, um, 
you know, I think, I think other than each one of us and just reaching out to our personal networks and sending a personal email reminder, which I, I do for kind of maybe about 10 people or so, but, you know, we have the same challenges. So we make these announcements, but if we're making the announcements to a small group, that's not very useful. We do put it on social media and we do send it out on our newsletter. Right. But again, same thing, you know, newsletter sometimes ends up in spam, you know, it may be like, you know, MailChimp sends, you know, Gmail will look at it and put it into spam. So we have the same challenge, you know. Yeah, Trip Dean, thanks for speaking to that. I, but I think you also raise a really like, important way to spread out reaches that word of mouth so those people who you know you have close relationships with and like send who you feel comfortable asking you know to come to a meeting or fill out a survey because I, I know like it is challenging to ask folks but even if you can commit to asking you know just a handful of your friends who you're close with tell them why you're passionate about why you became involved with this project and why you believe it's going to have an impact and reaching out just to those people I think that's, I think that's how you get somebody to show up to a meeting and stuff like that. Cause it's, if, you know, like it has having that relationship. So yeah, I know it can be hard reaching out to folks, like to large groups of people who you don't know well. So, but if you guys can kind of think about who those people might be um, and think about these meetings coming up in the next week, or even if the online survey, you know, seems like a more reasonable ask for folks, um, just kind of reaching out to, to just a handful of people. I think that can really make a big difference um, just in the turnout. And even, even if it just, you know, like it wouldn't take much to double our numbers <laughs> at these events. So if you can get um, just, you know, a handful of people to help show up, we would really kind of appreciate the additional effort just because we, we've had a pretty, pretty low turnout so far. Grace, what are the times for the next upcoming ones? Do you know? Um, I would like maybe the consulting team to make sure I don't mess it up, but I thought the, the maybe I'll, our song, do you have those times in front of you for the, for the workshops and the round tables? You know, I just looked at the yard signs. I, I had thought of this originally, but I, I actually think, you know, we didn't put enough information on those yard signs because on the yard signs, it's basically scan the QR code to get additional information, just like someone who's asking yeah. right now about the times. So this, this promotional material, I think, could have been better if we actually, if unless we didn't have the dates at the, when we published these, but to have the date and times or something on those would have been helpful. And, and yeah. also just so many events, it's hard right. to get them all on there. So the in-person workshops are five to eight kind of a drop in any time in there. And then the virtual versions, both the English and the Spanish, which happen at the same time, are um, 5.30 to 7. Is that correct? So, yep. Sorry, I heard you yeah. chiming in there. No problem. I, I was trying to answer a question and, and for some reason my mute button keeps disappearing on me. <laughs> it's, it's hard to switch platforms. And when you're sharing your screen, everything disappears. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So yeah, the, the Chaffee Park was the one that we had to hold on a Saturday just because the um, there wasn't a good location in the uh, neighborhood, which is something we've heard from the neighborhood um, that was available. The, the school was booked on for after school programs for all weeknights. So all the rest of them are um, the weekday evening time slot. Thanks, Ella. And then um, from our in our chat, we have someone who said they, and it is from the iPhone, so I'm not sure if that's a steering committee member or a member of the public, but they said they walked around small business owners and told you need, because you were told you need representation from Jefferson Park and Post Group, they already had a meeting on the calendar to attend, so that's exciting. No, and so yeah, we just wanted to take a moment to basically kind of ask for your help um, before we kind of with the outreach and kind of letting you know where we were at with that. And so we thank you so much for so all the time you've put into this. Um, but yeah, we just wanted to let you know that that's kind of a need we have right now with, with outreach. So yeah, if you guys come up with any ideas or you find something that works um, and that to get people there or to get people to fill a survey, um, please, please let us know. And I know that we actually, I wanted to share a success too. So we kind of optimistic to go. I know that um, the CCC used WhatsApp to promote um, the virtual roundtable um, to, to 
to people in the neighborhood who, are, who speak Spanish. And I think they had a lot of success with getting people to turn up to that virtual round table. I actually think, and I think Edson was there, um, but you could probably speak more to that. But I know that at least the registration for the, the Spanish speaking virtual round table was higher than the English speaking. So they were pretty successful. Um, and I'm not sure what the turnout was though exactly, but I assume it was higher than the, the, the other round table. So that was exciting to see. Was that was that through the promoters? That, yes, okay. the promotoras, yeah. That's good. Yeah. Okay, so I, I think I'll pass it off to, to Sung. Then if any, unless anyone has anything else they want to add in terms of ideas for outreach, otherwise I'll pass it off to Sung. Hey, this is Leslie Twarogowski. I, I have one additional question. Sometimes we find in our bid, it's easier to get uh, people interested when we're showing them a plan rather than when we're surveying about a possible plan. And so I'm wondering at what point we'll have uh, perhaps a plan to present to people and then call people in with their opinions on the plan. Yeah. So I can quickly answer that. Um, so right now um, we're kind of, you know, talking about the issues and opportunities and coming with preliminary strategies. Uh, the next phase is to really refine the recommendations and explore some alternatives. Um, and so that will happen kind of later in, in the fall. Um, and so ultimately, you know, all the substance and the, the, the strategies we're developing will take shape in the form of a draft plan. And we're hoping to have that by the end of uh, 2023. Um, so to your point, it, it is typical for people to get more engaged when there's something to respond to, like a physical document. Um, and, that, and that's kind of what, what's been typical for other planning processes as well. But yeah, so if we're talking about a physical draft plan itself, uh, we're shooting for it end of 2023. Uh, or sorry, end of 2022. <laughs> sorry to scare people. Yeah. <laughs> end of this year. Yeah, this year, this year. Sorry. I'm really bad with these. But yeah, this end of this year. If we don't have any questions, I'll wrap it up with this final slide right here. Um, so a question did come up last month about kind of meeting format and the possibility of meeting in person. Um, so we developed a quick survey. And so, you know, in our follow up email with you guys about homework assignments, I'll include a survey link for just to kind of gauge the committee's preference on, you know, whether they prefer to have it in person or maybe go on an alternative schedule or even you know, have in-person meetings just as optional so that it could take form as like a walking tour or happy hour. So just understanding kind of you know, people's preference. I, I know, you know COVID has died down this summer but is still on the uptick. And um, so I just wanna be respectful of you know, both sides of people that want to you know, meet in person and go over these presentations and conversations versus those that prefer um, kind of more of a virtual format. So as a follow-up email, I will include a survey for you guys to kind of weigh in and understand um, you know, the committee's preference. Uh, so I, I just kind of want to let that be known. Um, Ella, did you have, have anything to say? You just saw you just kind of turn your camera, but <laughs> it's fine. Sorry. I just finished eating my dinner. Oh, so. <laughs> great. I have mine too. I didn't finish it until... Uh, <laughs> uh, while you guys are in the presentation. So, okay, no problem. Um, so for the upcoming steering committee topic, um, we're going to talk about design character and preservation. Um, so that will be our next uh, focus topic discussion. Uh, specific to that, uh, we've developed uh, as part of the existing conditions kind of analysis as part of phase one, uh, what we call the pattern book. Um, so really that uh, document helps document some of the key uh, physical characteristics about the neighborhood, uh, about, you know, how, how the blocks are arranged, from how the buildings and homes look. So it helps uh, kind of provide that additional analysis and help people understand why does their neighborhood look and feel the way it does, um, especially when we talk about, you know, the, the words neighborhood character. So please uh, read that in, pre in preparation for uh, next week's discussion. Um, again, in my follow-up email, I'll just kind of break out break it down and kind of point to the pages that must that might be most relevant and digestible for the committee um, as well. Um, in early June, we will have a follow-up um, optional meeting to discuss more about the Sunnyside um, industrial area specifically. Um, so we've had great conversations with the community. We've had 
focus group conversations with uh, the business owners and, and local residents in the area. Uh, but we're also trying to get more property owners at the table. So that will happen in, in June. And once we kind of organize the time and, and, and location for that, uh, we will send that out. So for those uh, committee members that are interested in being part of that discussion, um, we'll, we'll invite you to that as well. But again, that's kind of an optional uh, meeting, and, and we're hoping to do that in person within the industrial area as well. Um, so more to come on that. Um, I'll keep you guys updated. Um, <clears throat> sorry, my Son, can yeah. I just jump in quickly? I want to I want to put in a plug for the pattern book. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I think that the um, you know, when we talk about things like complete streets, we all walk around on streets, we all drive, we all, you know, we've all experienced and interacted with our transportation network and have ideas to share. Um, I think that the design conversation can be intimidating for people who aren't professionals in that area. And, um, and I, I'm one of those people. And so I just, I wanted to put in a plug because I think that the pattern book does a really good a really good job of just introducing the different concepts and it'll talk about different terms and the kind of the words, the, the vocabulary that we'll be using. Then it has photos from the neighborhood to illustrate what we're talking about. So I think a lot of these concepts seem really abstract and like over my head, but then you see photos and you're like, oh yeah, I, I know what that is. So um, I think it really does a really good job of breaking that down and making it an accessible conversation. And then for people who are already really into that and excited to talk about it, it's going to be just a ton of information at a pretty fine, fine grain level. Um, so the councilwoman put into the chat um, that you can reach out to Naomi if you want a hard copy of them. Um, I know this is a kind of document I personally love to hold it. Um, so I encourage um, folks to take, take her up on that and, um, or just however you want to read it. I, I really do recommend taking a look at it and looking at the photos and um, it'll, I think it'll make everyone, uh, you know, more excited and more able to jump in on that conversation. Yeah. Cause Thanks. it's not, you know, it's not something we want to keep to just people who think about design on a day-to-day -day basis. We want to get this whole, whole group's input. So just wanted to put in a plug for that. And we'll have that available at, least at the in-person meetings too. Um, people have liked them so much, they walked away with it. So I had to put a label on them that says display copy only. So we don't keep finding things. So um, if you see that, please discourage that from taking those away. So um, so uh, looking into June uh, for our monthly June steering committee meeting, um, we'll have a kind of um, conversation about what we've heard as part of phase two. So some of the results might be pre preliminary, uh, but just to talk about, you know, we've been asking a lot of uh, questions, we've been having all these discussions, but what, you know, what are some of the key themes that have risen from this phase and, and how is it going to form kind of our next uh, task moving forward about developing recommendations and alternatives. Um, so that's uh, the June meeting looking two months out. Um, and, and that's really it at the moment. So um, any questions so far regarding all those things <clears throat> before? Uh, oh, so we have a couple minutes, so. Okay, going once, going twice. All right, well, looks like we, if we have no questions, we can um, end the night. Hey, we'll, can, yeah. you do, can you remind everyone the, the date, like the two meetings for Sunnyside are tomorrow and the next day, correct? Yes, that's correct. So the in-person meeting will be tomorrow, and then the virtual event um, will be the following day. So and that's then, at Smedley? Or yep, where? yep. And then, um, so yeah, the in-person meeting will be, um, yeah, at Smedley Elementary School from 5 to 8 p.m. And then uh, the virtual will be uh, that following day. Yeah. And and the virtual is in English and Spanish. So for those that know Spanish speakers, please let them know and sign up for that as well. And then son, maybe next month, um, I saw Emily asked about the Promodoras. Can we get an update for the group and just give a little, um, what is that model of the Promodoras and what are they doing and where are they at and where have they been? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I can, yeah. I can, I can uh, try to get them on board and do a quick update. Um, I, from uh, from what I've project updates I've received, um, just at a high level, I think uh, they're spending uh, the, a big chunk of time in May actually going out into the community 
and uh, uh, they took in our issues and opportunities report our, uh, our, our current surveys online, but kind of pulled out the key questions that might be most relevant for um, you know, some of the Spanish speaking population and other vulnerable populations we've identified. So they're going out in the month of May and really you know, boots on the ground and, and uh, making sure people are plugged in and, and, and taking those surveys um, and getting the word out. So, but I will work with them uh, to kind of bring them in our committee meetings to provide a more detailed update. Five to eight. Okay. All right. Anything else? Thank okay. you all. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody, and I hope you guys um, have a good rest of your evening. Thank you again for your time. Thank you, the churros really are delicious. Thank <laughs> yes. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Thank you all.